Hi, I'm Dan Burns, and I'm here to tell you about a new lab idea I've been working on for Pasco Scientific. Uh, it's a classic physics problem. If you have a chain that's in free fall, what will the force be on the ground as it lands? And so let's take a look at the theory, and then we'll actually measure it and compare the uh, measured force to what we predicted. Okay, here's the problem for a falling chain. We want to solve for the force on the ground. And so here's the chain. We're going to, to keep it simpler, we're going to release it. So the end is just above the ground and the chain has a mass M and a length L. X is how much of the chain has fallen at a given time. And M, little m, is the mass of that part that has already fallen. It's already on the ground. And so again, we're going to assume the chain is released from rest just above the ground. So that's uh, the initial x on the ground is zero, and it's also not above the ground. And we're going to uh, release it from rest, so the initial velocity is zero. We want to find the force of the chain on the ground as a function of time. And then we'll conduct the experiment and compa compare the two. So the force of the ground on the chain or the chain on the ground, it's a normal force. And you might just think, oh, it's just the weight of the chain that's fallen. But remember, when the chain hits, it's moving and it's going to be stopped. And so the force from that is the rate of change of momentum. And so we have it written in calculus form. There's a little bit of calculus in this, but not much, but it's a pretty cool technique that you could use on more difficult problems. So we need to figure out what little mg is and then also the rate of change of momentum of the chain. And so the weight of chain on the ground, little mg, and the force to stop the chain, the two different parts. The weight of the chain on the ground is not too bad. So it's just what fraction of the chain is already landed. And so in this case, there's some length x. And if I multiply it by the total mass over the total length, I get that fraction. x over l would be the fraction. So if half the chain had fallen, x over l would be 0.5 times the mass. And then, so the weight then would be that times g, and I rearranged it a little bit to put the x out on the end. So we've got that part of it. Now we need to figure out what this is. And so the a dp, an infinitesimal amount of momentum, would be the amount of mass times its velocity or speed in this case. Everything's going in the same direction. And so a dm is an infinitesimal amount of chain that's fallen. We want to know how much the mass of that infinitesimal amount is. Well, it's similar to what we did up here, except instead of some distance x, it's going to be an infinitesimal amount of distance dx. And so that would be an infinitesimal amount of mass of the chain that is just hitting that we're trying to stop. So dp then, if we substitute this in to dm, is m over l dx times v. But that's not the force. That's just the change in momentum. We need the rate of change in momentum. So we have to divide both sides by dt. So this is what we want, dp over dt. And notice where I put the dt to help us realize, oh, I've got a dx over a dt, what is that? Well, that's the velocity. And so we have m over l times v squared. And so that is pretty complex. Each step by itself, not too bad. It's hard to come up with that on your own until you practice ones like this. So now I have the uh, force from stopping the chain when it hits the ground, but we want to figure out what V is. Well, now we're just in free fall kinematics. So the chain is in free fall, and so the speed of chain, the, the chain can be found by constant acceleration kinematics. You could also use conservation of energy. The potential energy equals the kinetic, but either way, you're going to get the same result. So this is a common kinematics uh, equation, and in this case, A equals G, X naught is zero, V naught is zero, and so we get v is the square root of 2gx. So we can put that into here and square it. And then we get a much simpler result. 
m over l 2gx. And notice how it compares to the other component of the force, m over l gx. This is twice as much. And so the force to stop the chain is twice the force needed to hold up the weight that's hit so far. It's kind of a neat result. And now we can add these two terms together. And so I have a 2 here and a 1 here. So you add them together, you get 3mgx over l. And so anytime you do something like this, it's good to try and check before you go on. And so what about when the last part of the chain hits, x is equal to l then? The whole chain is falling, so the l would cancel, and we'd get 3mg for the force. And so that seems to check as far as with the units and everything involved. And it's kind of a neat result. Again, that's right as the last piece of the chain is hitting. After it stopped the whole chain, then it goes back down to 1mg. At least that's what we're predicting here. Well, this is a solution that gives me the force as a function of x, which if that's what you're after is fine, but we wanted to get it as a function of time. So can we write x, how far the chain has fallen, as a function of time, and we're back to free fall kinematics then. So I just rewrote our equation over here. We want x as a function of time, and so this is our constant acceleration equation. I'm making down positive, x not is zero, v not is zero, and a equals g. So we get a simpler result. And so now I can put this in for x, and I get our final result. And so this is the force from the ground on the chain, or vice versa, uh, as a function of time. And we can see it's a function of time squared in this case. So we'd expect a curve when we graph this. But you do have to be careful. This is, doesn't work for all time. It's only the time while the chain is falling. And so it's from time zero when we first release it and the chain hasn't is just starting to hit the ground. And then a maximum time when the whole length of the chain is fallen. And you can take this equation and put in x equals l and solve for t max. So that's good to have. You don't want to use your result for something uh, that's it doesn't apply to anymore after the chain has already fallen. Well, what does this look like when we're dropping the chain? I've got uh, several views here of the experiment. One, just a video, and then a couple of slow-mo from two different perspectives. And so it happens pretty quick, so the slow-mo is a little better. And you can see I have a little cup to catch it in. And the cup is on a force sensor, and so we can measure that force. And so here are the results of the measurements. Um, we have force versus time. Time doesn't start out at zero because you have to be ready to let go of that thing. And I was working on my own. You can have somebody try and start it right when you let go if you want, but you don't have to. And there's it's kind of noisy. Actually, the uh, initial result is even noisier. I've used the smoothing routine on this, uh, but it does look like somewhat of a parabola reaching a peak and then it drops off not quite as quickly as we would expect uh, but the chain is kind of rattling around a little bit as one part of the chain hits a part that's already there so not too surprising and then it levels off at almost 0.3 and the mass of this chain is 0.026 so times 10 newtons per kilogram um, It'd be about 0.26 would be the final result, and it looks pretty close to it. Now you can create a program, I'll show you that in a little bit, that would generate a line for the theoretical force, and that's the black line. And you can see it matches pretty well. Uh, tried to line it up as well as I could. It's on a, on a different time scale. But overall, pretty happy with the results. Uh, so this does check out with the theory pretty well. Um, I think if you're steadier when you drop it, maybe you could try different chains, uh, do multiple trials and so on. Uh, the equation here, if you put in uh, the maximum time that we talked about before, uh, it predicts a maximum force of 0.77 newtons, and this maximum force here is about 0.8. So that, that also agreed pretty well. Uh, at the end point there. You can see the drop-off 
uh, for the theoreticals much quicker, but that's just, I wrote the program that way. Uh, it's hard to account for the chain bouncing around. Now, if you're interested in doing this lab, I can give you some advice. And so I'm using a one meter long chain and it helps to have it steady when you drop it. So I put things up against a wall and I'm leaning my hand on this uh, piece of wood here to make it uh, uh, more stable. You could come up with a way to release the chain a little more um, automatically with a clamp or something, give that a try, but this worked pretty well. Uh, and so you can see, and you could try different lengths of chain as well. And so you can see I have the cup on a, a little pan with a force sensor sensor from the Pasco smart cart. So this is a close up of my setup, but any force sensor would work and actually would make it easier because uh, regular force sensors are all made to use with a ring stand. Uh, for the smart cart, you have to do some extra things. But the other problem is uh, force sensors don't come with a cup. And so I have this little pan here that I put the cup on top Easiest thing to do would be to drill a hole in the bottom of this cup and then use the hook that came with the uh, force sensor. Uh, that should say hook. Uh, and uh, attach it directly to the force sensor. The chain, uh, you can get any kind of chain. You can see here in this picture I'm using a beaded chain. That worked pretty well. But I also got this chain from uh, Michaels. You can find it anywhere. Search this. And it's uh, twice the density, the linear density. So it had more of a oomph to it. And uh, you could try bigger chains. At some point, it'd be dangerous, right? And would exceed what your force sensor could do. But you could certainly do bigger chains, too, if you want. That'd be another uh, neat thing to try out, give each group a different uh, type of chain. So if you do want to use a smart cart force sensor, which, which works really well, uh, it's very accurate, so you can run it at a high data rate, 500 hertz is, is what I recommend. You can clamp a smart cart to a ring stand with just a, a regular three-finger clamper, a test tube clamp or something. And that should work fine because this chain is not really heavy and it's not going to knock it off or anything. If you want to get fancier, though, uh, this thing that I have is pretty old. We don't sell that anymore, and this thing here that connects the smart cart to the ring stand. We don't sell, but you can print one out um, if you have access to a 3D printer. And so if you go to this web page uh, on our website, you can get the plans to print this out. That allows you to attach the smart cart to a ring stand. Even better, I think, uh, is another 3D project where you can turn your smart cart into a pan balance. And so this is a stand that you would uh, lay down the smart cart fits right into it so you don't need the ring stand and then this is the piece that would attach to the force sensor and so uh, give that a try um, you could do this with any company's force sensor it doesn't have to be a pasco one uh, it does help if you can run it at a high data rate it's an accurate one uh, but one thing you can do if you're using pasco is you can use capstone or um, SparkView and our new Blockly programming to generate the predicted curve. And so if you're interested in that, here's the code that I wrote for um, that black prediction line. And uh, students should be able to do this. It's not too tough, uh, but if you want to have the answer, here it is. And then uh, here's how you define your variables, but you might do it a little differently than I did, but this did work pretty well. Well, I uh, hope this helps you. If you're looking for new lab ideas, this would be uh, a good lab for an AP Physics Mechanics C class or a uh, college physics class. Um, the little bit of calculus isn't too bad if you want to just introduce students in an AP1 or honors physics class to something like this. I think they can handle it as well.